Amen. Praise the Lord. So did you say that there's a contest with the karaoke or is it just karaoke for karaoke's sake? There is a contest. There is a contest. But like even still, you don't have to carry, carry Toonie to karaoke, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that's a good thing to know. Um, so yesterday, on yesterday, Pastor Mark Trotter entered glory and he had a relatively short but very sharp fight with cancer, which some would say that he lost, I would say he won. And after the devil threw every kind of torture at him that you could, I think, physically imagine, um, he, was, he, he was not bowed and he did not give up his faith and he was nothing but encouraging to others. So <clears throat> my prayer is that God might use his passing even to draw our churches, our Living Faith Fellowship churches together, um, which are uh, uh, some churches like-minded with us in terms of biblical authority and how we preach the Bible and things like that. And, and you know, there are a lot of things I do I don't wear on my sleeve uh, unless I'm forced to. I usually don't even admit to it. I'm, I'm president of the board for a school in Kansas City. I'm also president of this Living Faith Fellowship. So churches, primarily all churches that Mark Trotter had his biggest influence in, from Michigan and Missouri to Malawi and from Ohio to Georgia. And, you know, so my prayer is that maybe in some way it just pulls us together as a band of churches for what we need to do in these end times. And if the question is, well, what do we do now? I mean, that's a big loss. Uh, he, was, he was our Samson with Delilah, you know? He was, uh, he was our champion. So that's a big loss. What do we do now? We worship, because if we worship, we win. And so that's, that's what I'd like to encourage you to continue to do with us this morning. So if you don't mind, go ahead and stand. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's have a word of prayer before we uh, get started today. You know, I don't, I don't like to micromanage things, or I like to think that I don't micromanage things, but you don't know how hard that is. You know, somebody said to Spurgeon one time, they said, I can't believe you said that. He said, well, you ought to know the things I kept back from saying. And, and you know, I don't like to micromanage, but I'm almost like, man, uh, you know, Brandon, I think, I think we need to do a song, and then we need to do announcements, and then we do need to do a song last. Because then, everyone who comes in late, they have at least a chance to get in on, you know, on one of the songs uh, with us. So let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you as we come together today. I thank you. We have set aside this time, first day of the week, at a stated time to assemble together, because that's worship. And we have people joining us online right at this moment from their own home, and, and that's worship. And Lord, we have the opportunity to... to to praise you and be led in, in singing and glorifying you, and that's worship. And Lord, whether we do it online or whether we do it here at an offering box here, we have the opportunity to give and to tithe, and that is an act of worship. And we have now the, the opportunity to pray, and prayer is an act of worship. And Lord, before we sit down, we want to ask you in this prayer, Father, be with us, instruct us from your word, because as we gather today to study your word together and hear it preached, that is an act of worship. And Lord, we want that worship to direct our steps, even throughout this week, so as we leave here, we can keep worshiping you. We ask it in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated in the Lord's presence. If you have your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 12. And since it's been a minute since we've been in the book of Revelation together, I want us to back up before we move on. Last week was Valentine's Day Sunday, so we, we, we took a different topic. But this week we're, gonna, we're alternating truth for the end times, book of Romans and book of Revelation. So book of Revelation, last time... We met a woman in chapter 12, verse 1, who represents the nation of Israel. And she is represented as a woman because the very first word announcing the gospel 
is found in Genesis 3.15. And that word from God was that the woman would bear a son and he would bruise. And the James gang also translates that word break the serpent's head or his leadership or his rulership of the kingdoms of this world. So in Revelation 12, she's represented as being pregnant because Israel is the nation through whom that Messiah is going to come. And so this is the backstory to the hatred that Satan has for the Jewish people. In verse 9, a great red dragon, that old serpent called the devil, appears. And you know, as regarding politics, a lot of people have a lot of concerns over a lot of issues, including believers. But since God is in ultimate control, his factor is always Israel. His eye is always on Israel. And so all kinds of political overthrows take place. You can see them in the Old Testament. In order to guarantee that Jesus is going to be born physically in Bethlehem by a virgin who was herself a descendant of David. And God, even in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, tells us God even uses the first Roman emperor and everyone underneath him to guarantee that was going to take place. So the rest of chapter 12 shows us some warfare in heaven in order to ensure that the Messiah, who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron, is born. And then it shows Christ's ascension back to heaven after his resurrection. So now the only option to thwart God breaking the head of the serpent is, order is, is for the serpent to destroy God's people Israel. Because if Satan can break the sword of the Spirit at that point, then God's head is bruised, his rulership is destroyed because his promises are crushed. So there is a seven-year period of prophecy being unveiled to us in Revelation 6 to 18. And you know, I, I don't even know how I feel about approaching this passage today. Because, you know, I know a lot of people have, I don't know if I want to call it a morbid curiosity, where it comes to chapter 13 and the Antichrist. I, and I'll say that, you know, we're not, I'm not approaching this from cur morbid curiosity. I'm approaching this from a faithful, prophetic word. And, and you know, the, if you're going to take and, and preach the Bible expositorily, if I'm going to be an expository preacher and I'm going to take a book and I'm going to take a chapter and I'm going to take a passage, then you kind of have to take it as it comes, whether you like it or not. And so last Sunday we took time off and, and you know, Valentine's Day. So it wasn't an expository message. It was a topical message from a number of chapters. But we're living in the end times and we are living in the last days before the events of these chapters 6 through 18 take place. And that is why we are able to see the foment of the nations actually forming the conditions under which one man will emerge to rule them all. The last half of that seven-year period, originally prophesied in Daniel as Daniel's 70th week in, in Daniel chapter 9, the last half of it is called the Great Tribulation, and that's because of the intensity of activity as things come to a head. So much so that angels now get directly involved as God's agents. We are that right now as the church. We are the ones directly involved as God's agents. But when the body of Christ is removed at the rapture, then angels become the liaison between heaven and history and between eternity and time. We are that right now. They will be that then, even though right now, and this is my thesis for today's study, the job of the angelic right now is to counteract the demonic that is seeking to destroy your life. And I want to take that hopeful word as our thesis because chapter 13 is really dark and seemingly offers no hope. I mean, there's only despair. There is no happy ending to Revelation 13. 
But all you have to do is remember that for every Friday, Sunday's coming. For every demon, there's an angel provided. And for every antichrist, there is the Lord Jesus Christ for the believer. So if you're losing to the devil in spiritual warfare, it's never because he's overpowering you. It's because of either your ignorance of God's word or your distrust of what it says, and so you're not following it. And through ignorance and distrust, you allow him to influence your thinking and deceive you, which then controls your behavior. And that's actually our first point for study. You only do what your thinking and your belief motivates you to do. So the battle is for the mind as the devil wants to affect your thinking. I mean, it cannot override your will, but you willingly function in his way if you do not anchor your mind and your will and your emotions in God's word. So you need the hope today of Bible promises and you need the practice of Bible principles. You need biblical authority. You need a faith-based view of the Bible so you can have a faith-based view of your life. And this is the only way that you break the power of the accuser. I mean, this is the only way that the benefits to us of God's fellowship with us are actually presented and preserved. And here's the way that both we and Israel will ultimately overcome. Look at verse 11 of chapter 12. And they overcame him by the blood, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Those two things. And because of those two things, they were able to not love their lives even unto the death. This is our second point for study. You will not defeat the devil if you do not see it as a life and death struggle. I mean, that's why baptism is so important after you get saved because you are personally, physically announcing both to God and the world and the devil and everybody, I am all in. And not only am I all in, in terms of being in the body of Christ with all these other people, I am coming at you from a new life, from the resurrection power of Jesus. So if you are a covert operative Christian, you will fail. You will fail. Even if you don't fall, you'll fail. It'll be a failure, even without a fall. You may be saved by the blood, but if you do not get the word of your testimony out, then you will still be defeated. That is the importance of our harvest teams that we're starting right now. And so, so let's tie our end time truths together. Look at uh, Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 on your handout. Then if thou shalt confess with thy mouth... There's the, Lord, there's the word of your testimony, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So belief gets you eternal salvation, spiritual salvation, but confession is what brings you deliverance. And deliverance is what is included in salvation. So now once Michael the archangel kicks the dragon's tail out of heaven in chapter 12, verse 12. The devil knows he's got to make his last stand as God of this world. And I think he says, you know, I can't, okay, I, I can't kill God because I tried that. I tried killing Jesus and Jesus was God and it didn't work. But you know what, if I destroy Israel so that God's promises are not fulfilled, I've checkmated him. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4 on your handout. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world, that's Satan, that's the devil, that's the deceiver. Because he's blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan thinks, look, if I can at least go on as God of this world, I mean, if I can take Israel out, I don't totally take God out, but there will have to be a division of rulership between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of hell. So the devil's already seen prophecy become history, 
with the first coming of Christ, and now he thinks he can still win the same way that he almost won with Hitler and Himmler and Heydrich. I mean, there was a satanic trinity in itself 70-some years ago in World War II. You know, Satan tried to kill God. The result was Jesus ascended back to heaven. So then he tried to destroy Israel, and the response was to put the Jew back in the land and defeat all of the demonically motivated neighbors wanting to drive them into the sea. So the crucifixion did not work because the man-child ascended back to heaven. The Holocaust did not work because Israel simply came back to the land. But oh wait, third time is going to be a charm because all that means is they are in one place where I can motivate not just the Arabs, but all the nations to destroy them. So Satan himself takes control for one last stand. So here's what he's got to do in these last three and a half years. Verse 13 of chapter 12. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. But for every 13th verse of rebellion, there is a verse 14. And unto the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place. Okay, there's a hiding place for the remnant where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. That is three and a half times. And then some, somehow that division into one year and the two following years and then half a year is going to be significant. And Satan is coming at Israel and God is protecting Israel. And in verses 15 and 16, Satan sends something overwhelming. But God opens the earth to absorb it on her behalf. I mean, have you ever had God swallow up something the devil was trying to use to overwhelm you? I, 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 you know, I don't, you know, so we got, you know, we got all these P's, right? I, I, I've been talking about the three P's. I, I guess we have to add a fourth P because we got the pandemic, we got protests, we got politics, and now apparently we have a polar vo vortex. And I, I don't think any of those peas are going to, you know, go away magically anytime soon. But I do think that God swallows it up for any individual believer. Why? Because look on your handout at Philippians 3.10. He does it that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. How? How? By being made conformable unto his death. So here's our third point for study. The way you discover the reality of God is by exercising your faith in the context of being overwhelmed, in the context of suffering, in the context of something that just doesn't quit, in the context of something that's over and over, in the context of losing ground. And, and, and you know, we need to be a believing remnant in these end times. Because what we will soon see is a Savior coming in the clouds for us. But what Israel now sees, what Israel now sees, watch, verse 1 of chapter 13, what Israel now sees is, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So the sand of the sea represents Abraham's physical descendants, like the stars of heaven represent his spiritual descendants. So seven heads and ten horns, that comes out of Daniel 4 and Daniel 7. So the beast comes on the scene to co-opt the empire of trust that America has built since World War II. Because you do know that the image in Daniel chapter 2 has two legs to it. I mean, Daniel chapter 2 is describing Gentile world dominion. And when you get down to the end of Gentile world dominion, there were two legs. And one leg is the ancient Roman Empire, and we are the new Romans. I mean, Rome instigated regime change in order to create allies. So she went to war to increase her security horizons for the purposes of her trade interests. And so after her Berlin wall, wall fell and after her Soviet nemesis was conquered at Carthage, she was the sole remaining superpower. 
And now the other leg of the statue. We, like she, have military bases. Now I know Senator, Senator Ron Paul famously stated in, in one presidential debate that they, we have 900 bases in 130 countries. And even with recent drawdowns, we have about a, at least 800 bases in about 80 countries. So the stage will be set for a 27-entity confederation of Western nations, seven heads, 10 military leaders, and 10 monarchs over those military leaders. So I will say again, this is truth for our end times. Verse two, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. You know, we call a man a monster whenever he seeks to exterminate people in mass, and usually for, for ideological reasons. So why does the world end up worshiping this monster? Well, look at verse three. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? I mean, who's able to make war with him? Why would anyone worship the devil through the beast? Well, the short answer is because they have dismissed God. They have blocked God out. And this is truth for our end times because we are watching right now the dismissal of God. Again, we're the new Romans. And our Supreme Court now with a six-person Roman Catholic majority... That, say, that court has still yet approved the same sanctioned marital relationships as existed in the ancient Roman Republic. I mean, the same immorality and dysfunctionality, state sanctioned. Likewise, our American love affair with abortion. I mean, we are all the new Romans. The only difference being that in the old Romans, it was only the man who decided the fate of the child. And back then, he was able to decide it very late term. So here's our fourth point for study. Since we have already witnessed the dismissal of God, the truth for our end times is the gospel. I mean, the gospel is the tonic for our end times. That's why our harvest teams are so important. You know what? Wait, wait. Let me approach it this way. Reversing gay marriage isn't going to save anybody. I mean, there are things that I'm not for because the Bible are against them, but reversing abortion isn't going to get anybody saved. It isn't going to save anybody. And as, you know, as a matter of fact, as we will see as we go through the book of Romans, all right, those, those children are all safe. So in the midst of even a worse mess than what we deal with today, in Romans 1, verse 10, you can see it on your handout. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Why in the world worship the beast? Well, number one, he has supernatural attributes. Verse three, the world is made to wonder whenever his fatal wound is healed. Number two, he has seductive appeal. Verse four, I mean, who's like him? It is, it is the spirit of the age, a satanically inspired leader. Number three, well, there's a security advantage to worshiping him. No military can overcome him because he is the sole remaining superpower. And you know, we need the security of our aligning ourselves with him. See, that is exactly how Israel thought in 63 BC. So Israel had gained their independence. Uh, and, you know, the proof of that and the evidence of that is the Feast of Lights that Jesus observed. It wasn't an Old Testament feast, but it, it, they invented it in between the Testaments because Israel got their independence from both the Ptolemies and the Seleucids the Egyptians and the Greeks, and, and now the Hasmoneans. 
and Judas Maccabeus, the hammer, and, and they've got their, they have their own independence, and then they start fighting with each other, and so they invite Rome to come in. They say, look, we don't want the Egyptians coming back here. We don't want the Greeks coming back down. The Romans are our superpower. It's, it's better for us. Let's invite them in. And that ended up in Judea becoming a Roman province two years before the birth of Christ. So exactly what will the Jews do when the Antichrist, in the, you know, in the first three and a half years, he shows up as a man of peace. They want peace and security. But now, number four, he ends up with the ability to deify Satan, verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. That's three and a half years. So what we discover is there's a second coming of Satan before there's a second coming of Christ. So the, the serpent shows up first in the garden and now he shows up here. Jesus had his first coming. His second coming we'll see. Just hang with us in the book of Revelation. And while the mystery of godliness is the truth that Jesus was God with skin on, the mystery of iniquity is also the, the truth that the Antichrist is Satan with skin on. And so number five, he has authority to defy sovereignty. Verse six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. I mean, he fulfills his name because devil or diabolos means accuser, slanderer, criticizer, malicious maligner. Number six, he has the antagonism to destroy saints, verse 7, and it was given unto them to make war with the saints and overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay, deep breath. My name is Alan. I'm your friend. All I'm doing is preaching Revelation 13. And we will get through this because chapter 14 is coming. So, so Hitler comes on the scene. And his Nazi party number, when he joined the Nazi party, was 5555. Now, God stopped him with divine intervention because he was an Antichrist, but not the Antichrist, 666. But now the God of this world becomes ruler of the world through the Antichrist. So, number seven, there is the acceptance to delude civilization, verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Every person since Adam and Eve has been born in sin. We know that from what David says in Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The sin nature Adam chose is inherited by all his descendants, but there's a book of life, and it's owned by the lamb. And that lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. I mean, it occurred in time, in, in 33 AD, you know, on a hilltop in Judea, but he was really, in God's mind, slain from the foundation of the world. And so everyone who is born is written into that book because the lamb that was slain has paid for the sins of the world. 1 John 2, verse 2. But if someone does not move from just having physical life, first birth, physical birth, to choosing to be born again, and spiritually have eternal life in Christ. If they do not receive the sacrifice of the lamb for themselves, their name is blotted out. It has to be that way. So that at the end, God can show them, look, it was right there. There's the space. I think there's a comfort when we look at things like abortion or the deaths of innocent children or those who are mentally impaired because as we will see later in the book of Romans, their names never have sin recorded to it, which would cause them to be blotted out. And that is the amazing effectiveness of the cross. John 3, verses 17 and 18 say, For God sent his Son into the world to, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already 
because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I mean, it's nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. It's, it's not anything you can do. You just have to trust. So your name gets erased from the Lamb's book of life, not because of original sin, Christ took care of that, but because of personal sin of your own. And if you've not repented before God and received the benefits of Christ's death, you are lost because the Antichrist will work in this way. If you look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10 on your handout, Paul, in speaking of this exact same time we're looking at right now in the book of Revelation, he says that that wicked shall come, capital W, the Antichrist, he will come with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So God doesn't pick some to be saved and skip others, but you opt out through sin by refusing the gospel. Because in Jesus is eternal life. And the, the death of Jesus addresses the whole problem of Adam's original sin and your personal sins, past, present, and future. So number eight, there is the autocracy to dominate sinners, verse nine. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. That's going to be the Antichrist policy. Here's the policy. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. It'll be just like that. You know, since it's like that, and believers don't fight that way, then here's the patience and the faith of the saints. So Revelation gives you the patience and faith of the saints. It gives you our patience in consistently, continually believing what is said in the Bible and approaching all of our life from a faith-based view of the Word of God so that we have a faith-based life. So here is what to look out for. Here is what to watch for as we process this truth for our end times. Number one, watch for a blatant devotion which will serve Satan. Verse 11, watch for it to come. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So the first beast comes up out of the sea, representing the Gentile nations. This one comes out of the earth, representing the land of Israel. And he has the look of a lamb, but he's got the mouth of a dragon. Give this guy a breath mint. Verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And now is completed this unholy trinity of the dragon and two beasts, the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet. You know, the Holy Spirit calls people to worship the Son. It's the Son of God. And the second beast calls the world to worship the first beast, the antichrist. And then the Son gives glory to the Father. Just like the first beast gives glory to the dragon because Satan is out to replicate God. So the first beast has a wound that kills him so the devil can raise him from the dead in a counterfeit resurrection. And I say counterfeit because when that beast comes back, he's now the son of perdition. So watch out, watch out, watch out for the coming, number three, of a blinding deception which will work wonders. Verse 13, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Well, that kind of beats global warming right there. And, and at that point, it would be scientific for you to worship him as God. I mean, after all, if the Roman Senate deified dead emperors, surely we should deify somebody who comes back from the dead. Which is why, verse 14, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. 
And this is a very dangerous time to be in because you can see on your handout from Matthew 24 that Jesus says in verse 24, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Those who have believed in God and refused the mark of the beast up till now might at this moment be persuaded to believe the lie. Because verse 15, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I mean, talk about transhumanism. This is, this is way beyond AI, right? Artificial intelligence. Because the image not only sees you watching it, it can tell if you are worshiping it. Hello, Alexa. I know this sounds sci-fi right now, but that's only because so many plot themes for science fiction are adaptations of Bible truth. So the final thing that we can start watching out for, even right now, number three is a binding deed which will control currency. If you don't think that's on the horizon, verse 16, and he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, say that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Okay, we've been through a dry run for this already. I mean, I, in a sense, we can already see this. The International Monetary Fund was established with the Bretton Woods Accords in 1944. And, and we, as Americans, we told the nations of the world exactly what they were going to do now that we had saved civilization. Now that we saved civilization, a new world order was coming. So there will be a new Bretton Woods Accord to result in a global financial reset and allow centralized control of all participating economies. So the same, those sa the same economies that started the IMF and denominated the American dollar as the one world currency in credit markets. See, money never was a real thing. You know, we print it. M uh, uh, okay, wait. Cryptocurrency. Hello, somebody. Money never was a real thing especially since it's no longer tied to a standard of some type. So the important thing for an economy is credit. I mean, I know a lot of people have great incomes, but uh, their problem isn't managing their money, it's managing their credit. That's why you need to take Financial Peace University with us this year. And, and when the banks freeze credit, then the markets collapse and you have a depression. The nonpartisan CBO just came out with the figures, Congressional Budget Office, just last week, I think it was, that our federal debt in 2021 will exceed the entire U.S. economy, and that's before the latest stimulus plan, plan is even added in. So this bubble will burst, and we know what to be watching for, because verse 18 says here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beasts, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. Now, six in the Bible is the number of fallen humanity, so it's repeated three times. 600 for the dragon, 60 for the first beast, six for the second. But to reject the brand is to set yourself up for a death sentence. Because taking that mark at this time is the only immunity passport there is in his economy. Yep. Your hand and your head belong to him, and it gets just that bad. Now, we've got to stop right there. But in conclusion, let me, let me tell you what to do in order to be ready. So we're going to end on a good note, even if this chapter doesn't. Okay, let me give you good news. Here's the happy ending. Here's what to do to prepare. This is what saints do when they face suffering. First, and this is number one, we see we must be watchful. That means we've got to face tragedy with trust. Because what the big Antichrist will do later, the little Antichrist are doing already. 
And you know what else? Maybe he can't do it to the world, but he can do it to you if you don't watch. Number two, be discerning. So test the spirits. When you see someone who looks too good to be true, well, you got his number. Number three, be faithful and refuse to be branded. Gospel light is vanishing. The darkness of false teaching is increasing. Doctrines of demons abound. There is a famine in our land for the hearing of the word of the Lord. And you know what? I think maybe the best two books to be published in the last hundred years is, is Mark Trotter's 52 Weeks of Pursuit, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And he won. You know, he won because despite everything he went through, he, he stood by the truth all the way to the end. And I'm meaning the truth that you can get out of a King James Bible. I mean the truth of rightly dividing Scripture dispensationally. I mean the, the, the truth, not only doctrinally, but all the inspirational stuff that flows from it that he shared with us in those two volumes and other stuff that he's done. So do not let the devil lie to you about God or lie to you about you. Refuse the mark and live off who you are in Christ. Number four, be enduring. That means you need to stand up for Christ and let God control the consequences. Because you love your life not even unto the death. There's no middle ground. I mean, you need to be all in. You need to be involved in every member ministry. Number five, be evangelistic. Make the gospel clear to the lost. Join a harvest team. Because if you're wrong about Jesus, you're wrong eternally. The spirit of Antichrist is to not deny Jesus Christ something that belongs to him. Worship, glory, dominion. And in the final analysis, this is number six, you must be wise. Remember the law of sowing and reaping. God has not forgotten any injustice committed against any of his children or any of our children because the invisible martyrs are going to be seen in the next chapter. That's where we begin to see some more good news. Let me just, let me just talk to you about one thing. I mean, very practically that you can do. And, and uh, you know, uh, we're wanting to add more opportunities to serve in our Harvest Kids because we'd like to expand it to 10.30 as well as 9 o'clock because already people come up to me on Sundays and say, you know what? I've had my vaccination. I can come. I mean, I just got my vaccination. I'm here. We're going to see that trickle uh, and, and happen as we uh, continue and, and keep going. And more and more people are going to be coming back. And we need, we need help at the 9 o'clock and not just do it at 10, not just force people with kids to only the, the 1030 service. And so, you know, whenever I look in, what I find out is that, the, you know, Sunday mornings are a blast, both for the kids and for the volunteers. And our nursery and pre-K is a great way to minister to young families. So if you want to make a difference in the lives of children and parents now, and you know what? There is a lot of things we can't do. Let's get back at the devil with the things we can. So we can't travel a lot. We can't go to other countries. We can't do mi uh, missions in terms of sending missionaries, that type of work uh, so much now. Okay, well, let's do home missions and let's take care of our kids. And you know what? The Sunday school teachers that a child is gonna remember are the ones that were with them during the pandemic. So you can sign up online, the information's in your handout, you can sign up out at the, out at the booth as you exit. They're in the welcome, welcome desk in the lobby. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian pray because you've got a choice today. I mean, there's a good choice still open. I mean, we can see the way everything's being orchestrated for what we're reading in the book of Revelation to take place, but it's not gotten that bad yet. It, 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 we still have liberty and freedom to preach the gospel yet. And you can choose the Lamb of God for yourself. I mean, would you be ready 
if either you died or you heard a trump blow and a voice from heaven say, come up hither, would you be ready today? Are you ready by being saved? And if you're not, all you got to do is pray. Because it's not anything you do, it's not anything you bring. It is just as I am without one plea. O Lamb of God, I come to thee. It's simply putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross for you. And all you have to do is pray and say, God, save me for Jesus' sake. I see it today. And today I am calling on the name of Jesus for eternal life. And if you do that, God puts you in Christ. He puts the Holy Spirit in you. We want you to know that. I, I want you to know the next steps. And so if you'll come up and let us know afterwards, I'll give you a copy of my book, Next Steps for New Believers. Or, or if you're online, if you'll write or email or text or call us, we'll get that information to you. Go ahead and stand and let's have a word of prayer as we get ready to leave. Father, Father, I want these prophetic truths to make a present impact. Lord, you're telling us about the future, but we need it to affect us right now. So Lord, somebody today needs to come to the cross and commit their life to you. And Lord, some people today have already made that decision, but they need to recommit, they need to reconnect, they need to reconsecrate, they need revival. You know, Lord, if the false prophet is going to cause blatant devotion to Satan, then surely we need to be totally, completely devoted to God. And if the false prophet is going to blind people with deception, then surely we need to be believers in the Word of God. And if the false prophet is going to bind people's possessions, then Lord, I need you to control my life. Lord, I need to control my tithe because only when I give that first tenth off the top of what you give to me, the first fruits, can I really trust you to help me manage the rest? And boy, that is, that is the factor we see, can see coming up on us the closest right now. Lord, I want everybody who's a believer, everyone who is in this church, whether they are a member, they're just attending. I want all of them to be straight on that factor because the first thing that's going to hit is the economy. And if we are not clear on what we do with what you give us to honor you, then we are sunk. So Lord, make me, make us ready for the day of your return. For we ask it in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Love you. Stay in the Bible. Share the gospel. See you back tonight at 5.30. If I don't see you tonight, I'll see you next Sunday. Love you. Have a great week. You're dismissed. If you need any help or assistance, spiritual help or assistance, come here to the front right now.